Hey, hello, good afternoon everyone. Um, this is a very important topic that we're discussing live today with a doctor from Apricity based in the UK in London. Um, and we're being joined by Dr. Sarah Vellas, um, who will be sharing his expertise, answering your excellent questions on recurrent loss, miscarriage, why it happens, um, what it is, reasons, your first trimester, um, prevention, anything that you can do in your power to uh, improve your um, chances of bringing home a baby. And we've had lots of readers who have been writing into us asking when this is happening because they have been so desperate to hear more from uh, the team and more on this topic. So um, hi to those who are joining. Please do have like share any questions, ask away. Um, the team is here to support you and they have a fantastic team. So we'll talk about as well as the medical side. So welcome everyone. Hang on. Let me see. Hi there. Hi to those who are joining. Hello, good afternoon, welcome. Hi, nice to see you, good afternoon. Lovely to see you too. I've just given you a brief introduction, but please could you start by introducing yourself um, and of course, Apricity, um, what you do, and uh, then we'll talk about the all important topic today, which is recurrent loss, um, prevention, treatment options, and uh, considerations for support, etc. Perfect. So well, lovely to meet you virtually um, and everyone who will be joining us. So my name is Soterios Sarabellos. I have a difficult name. A lot of my colleagues call me Dr. Sotti. Um, so I, I am an honorary lecturer with Imperial College um, yeah. and I've been involved in a lot of research with regards to recurrent miscarriage. Um, and also the college guidelines within the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I also work with Apricity and um, we work to help um, individuals suffering with any kind of um, difficulty, either conceiving or with pregnancy loss as well. Um, so it's a topic that's very close to my heart and I think very underrepresented as well. Uh, often not spoken as much as is um, IVF or infertility. So. Um, uh, it's truly a, pl a pleasure for me to join you and, and discuss it and trying to, you know, um, help couples that may be suffering with this condition. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for your time today. We've had some great questions come in advance. Um, so first of all, I'd love to know um, more about Apricity. What do Apricity mm -hmm. do for those who don't know? So Apricity is one of the world's first virtual fertility clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and it is quite a, an exciting um, adventure and clinic that's developing. Um, it is essentially trying to help couples throughout the UK and even beyond uh, with fertility problems. And we do that via virtual consultations wherever you are. Um, we do that by linking uh, couples and patients to various clinics throughout the UK. So not only physically having to go to a specific clinic. Um, and it is supported by a wonderful team of advisors who help couples throughout their fertility journey. They're on hand 24 seven. There is a dedicated um, IT team, tech team and AI team, and they work to develop applications and help with communication uh, and also help with personalized protocols of care as well. Um, so it is trying to make the journey, the fertility journey better, um, particularly through the pandemic, uh, it has had a great appeal. And uh, I think couples have benefited quite a lot through it. Mm -hmm. And we will be linking up uh, the Apricity website to our bio. So please do reach out to the team um, to have some expert guidance, especially following our conversation. So first of all, please, could you tell people watching, what, how do you define miscarriage? And then how do you define recurrent miscarriage? Mm -hmm. So that's a good starting question. It's an interesting one because one would assume, assume that the diagnosis or the definition is very easy but people throughout the world kind of argue about what the definition should be. Starting from miscarriage, miscarriage is any pregnancy loss that can happen at any stage of pregnancy. So following a positive pregnancy test all the way through to the first trimester, second trimester of pregnancy. 
Um, now, that is very common and more common than we think. And we may touch upon the statistics later on because they surprise often a lot of our patients. Um, yeah. Now, recurrent miscarriage traditionally in the UK has been defined as three or more miscarriages. Um, when you look worldwide now, in Europe, some new guidelines have come out recently that propose the definition to be only two miscarriages. Um, in the United States, um, they advise two miscarriages, so for so-called so recurrent pregnancy loss. But they do say that the miscarriages have to be seen on ultrasound. So it cannot be a miscarriage where there's a positive pregnancy test, which then turns negative, which is a very right. early loss called the biochemical one. Um, other societies, Japan, Swiss society, they have all different definitions. Some say they have to be in order. Um, some say you can have uh, a baby in between. And if you have a total of three miscarriages, it can still be recurrent miscarriage. I think the bottom line is we as the medical professionals and the clinics have to focus on the patients individually. We can't, the definitions and the guidelines are there to help, but we have to look at each patient individually. So for the UK, for the UK, the definition is three or more miscarriages. Interestingly, as we're developing the guidelines now within the country, um, there is no need for them to be consecutive. Also, right. it doesn't have to be a pregnancy that you see on scan. And also, most likely, uh, the guidelines will allow some flexibility and the recommendations in the country, whereby even if it's two miscarriages, you, you should be able to, to seek help and support. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so um, what you talk about the guidelines. Is this guidelines for people to then think about approaching a specialist or having treatment? Um, or can people act sooner if they want after one miscarriage? So um, generally speaking, it's to guide medical professionals and the okay. patients. Um, generally, the advice is if you, if you have three miscarriages, it is definitely recommended that you seek help and have investigations and tests. Um, there's a strong move within the UK now um, to move away from the traditional approach where nothing is done until you have three miscarriages. And that's been pushed and helped along by the Tommy's group as well, which are a great group doing a lot of research in the area. And they are now proposing a more modern approach where you actually can seek help after one miscarriage. And oh, yeah. according to you know the history, you can have more intense investigations because in a way, we have to be careful not to over-investigate people as well, because you can end up causing more harm than good. So uh, a kind of step-by-step -step approach is probably the most appropriate one. So I would say, even after one miscarriage, it, it is worth you know, touching base with either a fertility specialist, a GP, anyone to make sure that you're not doing anything wrong, there isn't anything that we've missed, um, and that for the next um, pregnancy, you know, everything is, is basically perfectly optimized. Mm -hmm. That makes complete sense. If anyone has any questions whilst we're going through, please feel free to ask. Um, and I know it's case by case, but what are the common causes and reasons for miscarriage? Why does it happen? So <laughs> there is a, quite a long list of causes of miscarriage. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the number one cause of miscarriage is, um, what's called a sporadic miscarriage, which means just happening by chance. Now, what that means is there's, there can be chromosome abnormalities in each pregnancy. So for example, if you imagine you can have a pregnancy where it will end up being a boy, um, you can have a pregnancy where it can end up being a girl. Um, if the chromosomes are such that it's an unhealthy pregnancy, it will end up being a miscarriage. Yeah. Um, so this is this is called basically you know chromosomal abnormality or often referred to as aneuploidy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's unbalanced chromosomes in the pregnancy. So this usually accounts for at least half, if not more, <laughs> of miscarriages. So that's the number one cause. Now the older we get, the higher the chance of that happening. So um, the chances of miscarriage will actually increase quite significantly after the age of 35 for women. Um, recent... What are the percentages? Sorry to interrupt you there, but what no, are the percentages? 
it, um, you know, depending on age brackets? So up until the age of about 35, it is believed that the chance of miscarriage is about 15%. Okay. Um, having said that, because most of the studies worldwide, their databases will be looking at um, definite pregnancies where there's been a scan or something like that. And so many women suffer with miscarriage and they don't report it or they have a late period or, you know, they feel they've had a miscarriage, but the hospital database or the GP will never know. So it's, it may be higher than that. The interesting thing when you look at the data is beyond the age of 35, as you approach 40 or so, and I was just looking at this data before we linked up, it starts to reach about 20% as you reach 40. And above 40, it reaches almost 30 to 40%. Wow. Um, and once you are 45, the chance of miscarriage is over 50%. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it quite steeply goes up. Um, it is interesting, the reason behind that is the genetic reason because women's eggs cannot be produced from scratch. Every yeah. woman is born with a set number of eggs. Um, and as we get older, it's almost like the DNA of these eggs becomes a little bit more unstable. So when it pairs with the sperm, you can have these you know, unbalanced chromosomes. But you can imagine from 15% going all the way up to 50% um, within a matter of 10 years or so is, is quite remarkable. Absolutely. We had someone recently you know, talking to us about sadly several losses and just mm. saying you know we don't seem to have a problem getting pregnant we have a problem holding the baby and yeah. so asking whether fertility treatment and IVF how does that help if the conception part isn't necessarily the issue what you know is it is it because of genetic screening of embryos what is it that might be able to help with fertility treatment it's an interesting one um, it falls under a few categories some some cases of miscarriages actually may not be down to just random abnormalities. The parents may have some um, abnormal chromosomes. Interestingly, because even though their chromosomes may be kind of asymmetrical, in number they are perfect in total. So each parent will be fine and healthy. But when they divide to make a baby, because they're kind of asymmetric, the pregnancies become abnormal. In, that, in, in those cases, IVF may help through screening of the embryos to make sure that they're balanced in terms of chromosomes. Right. Okay. Um, otherwise, generally speaking, IVF doesn't necessarily help with miscarriage. It may help in a, in a specific group of women who are older in age, but who are fortunate in a way enough to have lots of eggs. And when they have IVF, they produce lots of embryos. And therefore, by screening the embryos, you may be able to find the, you know, the one that appears to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for a lot of women, as they grow older, they have a lower number of eggs. So it may be that you go through the whole IVF process and you only have one or two embryos. And then when you screen, it may be that it appears to be abnormal. So um, it remains to be seen which particular groups of women, you know, the IVF and screening helps, but it's certainly not for everyone. Okay, that's really useful to know. Mm. And what about treatment options such as blood tests, looking at immunology, that kind of thing? So I guess it depends on the underlying cause. So we've touched upon the genetic cause. Um, one of the major causes is that of um, a pro thrombotic, a pro-clotting condition, uh, often referred to as sticky blood. Um, the most well-known one is so-called antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, so that can be tested through a blood test. If someone is found to have this pro, the sticky blood, as it were, uh, what appears to be happening is in these cases, it may clog up the placenta or the blood flow to the baby as the pregnancy is growing. So in those cases, uh, blood thinners can help. Things like um, heparin um, or aspirin um, may help. Um, other causes may be, for example, hormonal imbalances, um, things like polycystic ovarian syndrome or high male hormones. Um, difficult to treat, but if there are significant imbalances in hormones, any attempt to improve that, um, whether it's through weight loss or controlling PCOS, 
abnormal thyroid as well. So abnormal thyroid and abnormal um, kind of diabetic regulation too. Regulating all of that from a hormonal point of view can help. Um, in terms of treatments, um, abnormal uterine shape. So some women have um, a heart-shaped womb, which yeah. is called a septate or completely divided, like the septum and the nose, they can have literally divide in the middle. Or they can have a double uterus. In fact, most animals or a lot of animals seem to have double uterine. So cats, for example, have double uterine, just like we have double, just like we have two kidneys. Um, and they seem to do well, but they often end up with lots of kittens, whereas we often have one baby at a time. Um, or you can have half a uterus. So just like you've got two kidneys, in humans, the two uteri basically end up in one womb, and you can have half a womb. All of these abnormalities, um, if they're picked up, they can be associated with miscarriage. And it seems like by cutting a septum, uh, that may improve the chances for some women. Um, the other abnormalities are more difficult to treat. So at the moment, we don't really have any treatment for. But the septum, the one with the division, is the one that we are possibly able to treat. Interesting. And I, yeah. And I think at this stage, I would say we should never, ever under, underestimate all the lifestyle factors as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen patients who have had the most advanced testing and 3D scanning and uh, all the blood tests and everything. And I say, by the way, you don't smoke, do you? And they say, oh, yes, I do. And I'm thinking, wow, we, we should be focusing on, you know, things which we consider basic, but they're not really. Um, BMI, abnormal BMI has been uh, linked with miscarriage. It is interesting because people often talk about high BMI, but with miscarriage, it possibly points towards a low BMI, maybe even worse than a higher BMI. Um, so the, the extremes of BMI are important. Smoking is important. Alcohol um, yeah. has been linked. Caffeine as well, but within reason, you know, so just excess amounts of caffeine may be linked to miscarriage. Um, vitamin D, low vitamin D levels, perhaps. And nowadays, there's some work around environmental toxins and things like that, uh, which remain to be seen. I wouldn't be surprised if we find that, you know, our kind of nowadays living, especially in the large cities, is also having an impact. Um, some are a bit more experimental, you know. So you mentioned immune testing. Yeah. So immune testing often sounds very fancy and very sexy, you know, and a lot of patients um, inquire about that. Um, there are links with uh, immune, immunity and miscarriage for sure. And there's a whole field called reproductive immunology that looks into this. Um, but at the moment, we don't have, we don't know for sure what treatments and in which scenarios they seem to work. Um, and you know, we were talking about the guidelines before. If you look at European guidelines, um, you can tell how there's been debates amongst all the European experts because they say for some specific Scandinavian women, we recommend this test and we can treat these women. And it's quite clear that there was someone, you know, from Denmark who really believed yeah. in this and, you know, the rest weren't so sure. So yeah. I think in, in the years to come, we will probably have more information, particularly with regards to things like NK cells, which seem to be the most popular at the moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about things like um, aspirin? I know you mentioned blood. Thin so if you have an abnormal, if you have abnormal clotting and you have essentially sticky blood, um, as they call it, uh, aspirin and heparin will help. That's been shown to help. The, tr the, the difficulty lies in the cases where um, all the tests come back as normal. But, you know, someone has suffered miscarriages and they're, they're really desperate to try anything or find, find some solution. Um, trying things like aspirin or heparin, other blood thinners, to treat that, it has actually been shown in, um, in the Netherlands, I believe, they did a beautiful trial where they gave these women aspirin and or heparin and it didn't show any improvement. So they said if you don't have any abnormality in your blood, don't take any treatment. And the way I look at it is, if you're cooking or you have a recipe, you know, 
it doesn't mean that when you add salt, it will always improve things, you know. Um, if there's a lack of salt, then you need to add this. If there's a, an excess of something, adding more of it may make it worse. Um, and I, yeah. pardon? It's a very good analogy. Yeah, and, and I have seen, I remember seeing a patient years ago who um, had miscarriages. Her tests were normal. Um, and she was asking about blood thinners like aspirin. And at the time we said, you know, we don't think it's indicated because your blood seems to be perfect. So she came back and she had bleeding. Um, and it wasn't the first time that she had bleeding in pregnancy, but this time she was so upset, so upset. And she did indeed have blood within her womb and it looked like it, you know, could be a miscarriage again. But she seemed almost disproportionately upset versus the previous times. Um, and I said, what, what's wrong? There's something different. And she said, actually, I, I went and got blood thinners myself um, and I started taking blood thinners and I think I've caused the bleeding. Oh, gosh. Um, and, you know, I thought to myself, poor lady, you know, she, she was just trying to do anything possible. Um, and, you know, she clearly felt that she may have caused the miscarriage. So I always remember that example in the sense that, you know, some more, sometimes less is more, let's put it that way. It doesn't mean when you add in treatments and add in treatments that it will improve things because sometimes you may worsen the recipe. Mm -hmm. If someone um, gets, becomes newly pregnant after experiencing loss, do you recommend that they seek advice straight away to, you know, try and maintain the pregnancy? Yeah, if, if they've had a previous loss before, I, I think they should. Um, I think for two reasons. One is for psychological support, you know, just to make sure that they're, they're, they're being seen by a team who can look after them, they can answer their queries. Um, another interesting one is we know that women who have repeated miscarriages actually have a higher risk during pregnancy. So in the past, there was the thought that once you are pregnant and it's a successful pregnancy, you then can go down the low risk route. Because, you, right. you know, because you've managed to go beyond, say, the first trimester and everything will be fine. And almost, well, usually it is absolutely fine. But we now know that these women have higher risks of, um, of complications. Mm -hmm. So just because they may have had miscarriages early on and say they may be 20 weeks, it doesn't mean that, you know, we can forget about the history. Mm -hmm. They have to be monitored closely and they have to have serial scans often. Um, because they are at high risk of de developing complications in pregnancy. And for people who are perhaps in their late 30s or 40s, mm -hmm. the, the risk is increased. I mean, um, obviously, a lot of us will have read that Britney Spears sadly had a miscarriage. Yeah. In the um, so, you know, what's your advice for people who might be trying to get pregnant at a slightly older age? Yeah, but it's an interesting one. Um, because there is this link with um, age, um, we always worry about age. And in terms of infertility or in terms of miscarriages or complications, the risks do increase with um, increasing age. So, you know, it, it is worth being looked after in a, in a team um, and have closer monitoring. But again, the overwhelming majority of women do really, really well, even in the older ages. So I think we have to be careful that the message is not one of disaster. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think the message should be one where we need to look after people, you know, closer, but actually we do expect things to be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, actually, after that announcement um, about Britney Spears, we had lots of people messaging us saying, I'm newly pregnant, I'm terrified now. Yeah. But I think sometimes things in the media also can be helpful to sort of see that other people are experiencing things. Sometimes also in the community, it can be, um, it can make people more fearful. Yeah, yeah, it, it's all about the balance, you know, just like in terms of treatment, I, I think of the balance of the recipe. I, I think it's the same thing with communication. You have to be so careful with, you know, communication because mm -hmm. the same thing exists. If you say, oh, age has no effect, you know, you can go down the low risk route and deliver at home, for example. It, it may be putting someone at slightly higher risk. But on the other hand, if you're saying that you should never be pregnant at that age, it's super high risk. That's also not correct. So 
it, it should be a balanced approach, both, both in terms of investigating, treating, but also communicating. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And why is it that miscarriages tend to happen more frequently in the first trimester? That's a really great question. Um, the reason is that basically it's almost like checkpoints of a pregnancy developing. So um, the more, when you start off with a pregnancy, you may have um, a pregnancy sac with no embryo inside. Um, so when you're expecting to see the heartbeat, that there may be nothing there. This will be very early on in the process and the miscarriage will happen early on. As weeks go by and, and the body allows the pregnancy to develop, the body senses almost that things are going well and it almost knows that there's a heartbeat now um, and now the baby's developing a head and arms and legs. So what happens is early on is where it's almost like a pyramid all the main and biggest abnormalities are picked up so early on, the body almost recognizes them early on, so the miscarriages happen early on. And any pregnancies that make it beyond that um, basically imply that these pregnancies are healthier because the body has let, it, let the pregnancy continue. Um, and in fact, once you go into the second trimester, the chance of miscarriage becomes very low. And um, I was going to ask, um, considerations so at apricity and in your experience at what point for people struggling with recurrent loss would you suggest or would the team suggest um other other options to parenthood such as egg donation um, surrogacy that kind of thing you know it's a really great question it, it really depends on the individual case it really really does there are there are some patients where literally there's an abnormality and once you treat that abnormality, whether it be blood thinness, for example, or um, surgery to the womb for an anomaly, um, they really do extremely well. They really have a very good outlook and good prognosis. Um, there are other couples um, where their history is such or the findings and tests are such where the chances of success are really very low. Um, and in that case, things like egg donation, for example, may, may literally, you know, turn the, the um, chances in our favor. So it, it really depends on each individual case. Uh, I think what I would say is if someone is uncertain or they have questions um, or they feel like, you know, they're lost, they, they, sh they should never feel that way and they should seek help. Um, and again, whether it be through apricity, uh, their GP, wherever they have their, you know, first port of call, that they should be, um, they should be able to be guided in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And at apricity, what kind of emotional support is available for patients who are dealing with recurrent loss? So at apricity, because it's a, a fertility clinic, um, there is a counselling service. So there are counsellors that are able to help with the emotional side of things. Um, and of course, because there's the team of the advisors, the nurses and the doctors too, um, there can be support in all these aspects because there's often the need for emotional support. There is often the need of medical reassurance. You know, am I doing this right? Have I left anything out? Um, and sometimes, you know, just someone to kind of touch base with you know see how you are and um are you ready to have any treatment or tests if you need them um i'm very it's i'm always surprised at how sometimes simple things make a very big difference you know mm -hmm. um just touching base with someone and asking if they're okay can can help for miscarriage um for the group of women with miscarriage where with repeated miscarriage where the tests have shown no abnormalities so that's the so-called unexplained um, recurrent miscarriage group often it's the most frustrating one for patients because they say i don't understand i've had all these tests and we haven't found anything but uh, it's one of the best groups in terms of chances 
because their chance of a successful pregnancy is about 70 up to 80 percent with the next pregnancy um, and some studies going back to the 80s now the first one i think was down in new zealand in 1979 if i'm not mistaken was saying that when you support these couples um their preg the chance of success increases um, and reaches the levels almost of the general population if there's nothing else wrong um, and that's coined as um, tlc tender love and care you know so sometimes that's the best treatment of all yeah amazing well thank you so much for all of your expertise Very today so um, it's been really lovely to chat to you and um, I'll link up the link here to this live uh, for people to contact your team if they'd like to discuss it further. But it's been very insightful. If you've got any questions for the team, you can DM us or you can contact them directly. Um, it was really wonderful to speak to you today. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Have a lovely evening. Take care. Bye-bye.